like it could be about to achieve long-term peace with North Korea, which is amazing and unexpected. In the Middle East, though, the administration appears to be moving toward a possible showdown with Iran. Is this wise? And could, in fact, feuding with Iran imperil negotiations on the Korean Peninsula? Here's what Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard of Hawaii had to say about it. We talked to her a minute ago. Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard is a Democrat representing the state of Hawaii, and she joins us now. Congresswoman, thanks for coming on. You've been, thanks, um, I would say, nonpartisan in your assessment of foreign policy issues. You're for some, you're against others uh, connected to the administration based on whether you agree with them. So given that, what's your view of what's unfolding in North Korea? Well, Tucker, this is actually a really historic opportunity that we see unfolding before us right now, uh, important to the people of my home state of Hawaii, the people of this country, and to the world, where we have an opportunity to uh, make an agreement that will denuclearize North Korea uh, and help move us closer towards peace. Uh, you know, whatever people feel about Donald Trump, whether they like him or they don't like him, this is the time for people to rise above the partisan politics. Recognize this is not about Donald Trump. This is about peace for the American people and for the world, and the opportunity to make an agreement that will finally end the Korean War and bring about the denuclearization of North Korea. If we fail to do this, if President Trump is not successful in this, uh, the consequences would be uh, dire for the people of this country uh, and to the world. So Congress has an oversight role here. Presidents don't get to conduct foreign policy solely by themselves. Congress needs to be informed. Are you confident that you're getting enough information, not just about North Korea, but about what is happening in Syria, for example, or with our posture toward Iran? Are you getting the information you need to make informed decisions about it? Yes and no, but I think in, in each of these cases, it's important for us to recognize what is our objective and how does it best serve the American people. Uh, this is why I've been calling for quite some time now for direct negotiations uh, between President Trump and Kim Jong-un, uh, recognizing that it's critical for us to engage with our adversaries and talk to them, not just our friends, uh, so that we may achieve peace and avoid more, uh, more war. Uh, there are three things that need to happen in order for Trump to be successful uh, in these negotiations that will coming up that will be coming up in the coming weeks. First of all, uh, it's important for uh, North Korea to have a, a credibility, or for, for President Trump to have credibility with North Korea uh, in making sure that if North Korea makes this agreement with the United States, gets rid of their nuclear weapons program, that the, the United States is not going to go in and launch an attack and topple the North Korean regime. This is the reason why they've had their nuclear weapons program as a deterrent to regime change. Uh, a few things need to happen in order for that credibility to exist. Number one is we need to end the regime change war that we've been waging in Syria since 2011, both directly and indirectly, uh, and end our policy of going around and acting as the, the policemen of the world, toppling dictators that we don't like. Number right. two, President Trump and his administration, they need to publicly acknowledge that Bush's overthrow of Saddam Hussein was a huge mistake. They need to publicly acknowledge that President Obama and Hillary Clinton's uh, toppling of Gaddafi in Libya was a huge mistake. Uh, in, that, in that situation with Libya, uh, we need to recognize publicly, Trump needs to recognize pub publicly that this agreement was made with Gaddafi to get rid of his nuclear weapons program. Uh, in exchange for the United States is not going to come in and attack you. Now, a few years later, that's exactly what happened. We went and dropped bombs in Libya, uh, and Gaddafi was toppled. Uh, and, and lastly, but perhaps uh, maybe even most importantly, with this Iran nuclear deal um, that we're facing right now with President Trump threatening to drop out of it, an agreement was made between the United States and Iran and other countries to end Iran's nuclear weapons program. So far, uh, Iran has shown to be in technical compliance with this deal. For Trump to just say, hey, we're going to throw this deal in the trash, uh, threatens the ability for North Korea, for us to make this deal with North Korea, North Korea to say, hey, how, how can we trust that the United States will uphold their end of the deal when we've seen time and again that they have broken their promises? Interesting. On the campaign trail, 
the now president very often denounced the war in Iraq and in Libya, but um, not as much since becoming president. Congressman, thank you very much for, com for coming on. It's interesting. Those are connected. Thanks, Tucker. I appreciate it. Well, we recently talked to author Nassim Taleb, who's got a new book out. During the interview, he explained why the people who run our government seem so eager to start fights in distant countries because they are risking nothing personally by doing so. Here's part of the conversation. Never in history, never in the history of mankind have we had people who were warmongers without being in battle. Yes. This is the first phase in history you see that. That's interesting. So how yeah. would you how would you reconnect risk to reward? <laughs> well, decentralization is one issue, one 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 uh, obvious solution. In Switzerland, decision makers in Washington look at an Excel a spreadsheet, and they're not penalized by by by, by those <laughs> they're punishing.